Well, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to all people whose effort made this uh, conference possible, especially special guests, Kono-san and Tan-san, and uh, the best organizer, uh, Hori-san. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'm very honored uh, to moderate this exciting session. Uh, we have uh, two special guests, as I mentioned, a modern special guest, superstars maybe, uh, Professor uh, Tang, uh, Dr. Tang, and uh, Minister Kono. Uh, as you know, Minister Kono played a very important role as a former Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister for Defense, and Minister for Vaccination. And uh, Dr. Tang also played a very important role, as you know, in Taiwan, fighting against COVID-19. Uh, and uh, based upon the experience, we'd like to discuss uh, digital leadership and the innovative uh, resilience, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, first of all, I'd like uh, each panelist to uh, make a uh, breakout uh, presentation uh, for five minutes or so uh, based upon your experience. Uh, but before going into the main subject, maybe you and including myself, would like to hear Kono-san's opinion on the general election three days ago. <laughs> yeah. Kono-san, I really appreciate your very honest, frank comment <laughs> on the general election the other day, and also including the presidential election in LDP, if possible. Okay, please, Kono-san. Good morning. <clears throat> I kind of lost voice in the general election, so allow me if it's not easy to listen to. Well, I went through the leadership election in September and uh, general election in October. So for the last two months, I haven't spoken English at all. So my tongue doesn't move smoothly as before. So allow me for that too. Well, for the general election, I think uh, the take is, uh, well, we were able to beat back communism and uh, we were able to stop the communism infiltration. So that was good. I was seriously worried about the uh, uh, opposition party uh, getting together with the communist. Uh, that's how Communist Party took over in Eastern Europe right after the World War II. They started out working with other party for the campaigning and the coalition government. And they ended up kicking out all the rest of the party and uh, uh, dominated the political scene for the next 50 years. Uh, it didn't happen in Japan. I was so, gra I was so glad about it. Well, the other thing is number two. Um, well, according to the media's opinion poll, LDP was supposed to not lose, but uh, lose a lot of seat. So I had to go around about 75 election district and made uh, uh, over 150 speeches uh, in two weeks and uh, I lost my voice, but uh, it, I mean, the result shows we didn't do too bad. I mean, we lost uh, 15 or so, but that is acceptable. Um, so we, we thought opinion poll is a, something scientific based on uh, science of statistics, but uh, it wasn't like this. So we are wondering what the hell is going on inside the media. Um, in this election, I could say SNS played a very significant role, uh, probably for the first time. Um, it did have uh, some influence on, especially among the young people. And uh, we realized Quite a few LDP candidates were not good at uh, dealing with SNS. 
Uh, I'm now head of a uh, public relations bureau of LDP. So I have a lot of work to do uh, for the next uh, upper house election in the summer next year. Um, <clears throat> through the leadership election of LDP and general election, we never talked about the burden. We never talked about the tax. We never talked about the deficit. Um, you know, I got advice from my friends, don't talk about tax, don't talk about burden, don't talk about the deficit. That's not a good time. I mean, it's COVID-19, you don't have to talk about it. Um, kind of, well, COVID-19, you, you just have to, uh, you know, ease the money. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of business, especially <clears throat> SMEs, have excess deficit. And then as we go through the COVID-19 to normalization process, how are we going to deal with this excess deficit? That should have been one of the big topic, but uh, no one talked about it. Uh, no one talked about uh, public deficit. So up to upper house election next year, how are we going to deal with this? Are we going to ignore it? Or are we going to start addressing these issues? Uh, we didn't really talk about uh, global issues like uh, uh, climate change. Um, well, it was, we talked a, a little bit about uh, uh, nuclear power and other issues, but uh, we really didn't address how we going to deal with coal, oil, um, natural gas, uh, you know, things like that. So it was, in a way, everyone was sort of avoiding the issue and the uh, pretext was COVID-19. So not quite sure if, if that was great campaign or not. Um, for COVID-19 and the vaccination, I'm very thankful for everyone uh, for getting a uh, vaccine. Now, over 12 years old, I think the vaccination rate is now over 85%. Entire population, thank you. More than 70% of uh, entire population getting two shot. And for 65 years old and older, it's reaching 93%. So it's very difficult to find those who have not been jabbed. Um, we started out, my, my my job as Minister for Vaccine Rollout is just to hit the health ministry. Uh, <laughs> they, they refuse to use the system for recording. They say the paperwork is fine. And they were seriously considering uh, keep track of who has vaccinated, who has been vaccinated with paper. I mean, 100 million people for twice. Uh, we set up a, a vaccine recording system and uh, I think it worked quite well. So we really need to, I think we were very able to show people that we really need to move on to the digital society. Um, we, we fail to come up with a new system for emergency. The vaccination law that we applied was uh, the vaccination for business as usual. And uh, that was supposed to be the job for municipalities, but the uh, health ministry tried to tell each cities and towns how to do things. And uh, my job was to tell mayors, ignore that. <laughs> do whatever whatever way you want to do. And I think that's why we are so successful. I mean, city of, city of Yokohama have uh, nearly 4 million people living in the city. The smallest village has population of 170. 
And we can't do the same, we cannot apply the same system to the city of Yokohama and the smallest village. So we have to give authority to the mayors. And uh, I think we need to learn that. Um, then uh, to the future, I think we really need to spread telework. Uh, there are a very strong resilience in the government for doing telework themselves. When I was a minister, I told my people, uh, okay, you can, you can only 30% of you could come to Kasumigaseki and 70% need to stay at home or satellite office. And they were able to do that. So even in the Kasumigaseki, if you decided to do that, you could do it. But I mean, most of the bureaucrats didn't want to do it. So we need to change the mindset. And I think we need to speed up the process of bringing up uh, <coughs> um, 4G to 5G throughout the nation so that each and every major company could do it. Uh, we, are actually, we are actually seeing people moving out of Tokyo uh, for the first time in so many decades. So teleworking in the future would stop people coming into Tokyo, but keeping people stay uh, where they're from. And I think that's good to, for the balanced growth. Um, and then the government, uh, the, the bureaucrats in the government are not allowed to use Zoom, uh, not allowed to use WebEx and uh, you know, those uh, systems that you need to work for, work with. Uh, we were told to use Skype for business, but uh, if you have used it, it's not a quite as easy as the other application. So, I mean, it's important to keep the security, but uh, it's important to increase the productivity and it's a balance. You, I mean, some digital people in the government tell you not to use the Zoom or not to use the Google you know, applications. It's simply because if something happened, they have an alibi. We told you not to use it. And uh, they were not trying to increase the productivity. They were only trying to escape from the responsibility. And that's not what you are supposed to be doing if you are in charge of the digital system. So there's a lot of issues we need to address, uh, but uh, I mean, yesterday, my prefecture, Kanagawa, only got like six new COVID cases. So thanks to the prime, former prime minister, Suga, we promoted the vaccine and now it's, it's quite getting better. So now it's time to talk about the economy. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Kono san, for a great presentation. Well, maybe you may have a lot of questions uh, to him, uh, mostly focusing on the general election, maybe. Uh, but later on, the floor will be open to your comments and the questions. So just please wait. And uh, Dr. Tan, thank you very much for waiting. And uh, I really hope to hear your uh, experience. Uh, as was mentioned by uh, Mr. Kono, you also have a lot of difficulties fighting against other ministries and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I really hope to hear your very honest opinion on this point. Uh, Dr. Tan, please. Thank you. <clears throat> that was fascinating. Uh, I'm really happy to be here virtually uh, to share some thoughts around not just resilience, but how to do innovation. Uh, as you probably know, I'm digital minister in charge of social innovation in Taiwan. And social innovation means that the government trusts the citizens instead of asking them to trust back. I mean, some do, but it's about us trusting the citizens. And it's about innovating, uh, not for the people, uh, but rather with the people. Some of you may have uh, heard about Taiwan's use of digital technology, such as a map visualizing mask availability, such as a SMS-based contact tracing system to checking into venues, and even our vaccine appointment system. The thing is, none of these is my idea. 
all of this is ideas from the civic technology community, in particular, uh, GUB0, G0V. So I want to start by, of course, um, noticing that most of the people who are closest to the pain, to the places like the pharmacies distributing the mask, the individual venue owners working with paper-based check-in trails, uh, the individual clinics administering um, vaccines as well as their municipalities and townships, these people understand the best, um, as Mr. Kono put it, um, if they are able to not really ignore the central government, but uh, remix whatever the central government has to offer, then it leads to better co-designs. So I understand this summit um, does not like uh, PowerPoint presentations. So I'm not doing any PowerPoint presentations. I'm putting them behind me. Uh, so this uh, is a, a demo, uh, not a presentation uh, per se. All right. So as I mentioned, the, the Gov0 um, did this mass creationing map together uh, with the pharmacists. And the important thing is not how accurate it is on the first day but rather how the data biases, inaccuracies, the um, display of the visualization that allow people to see, even though that the distance between each average citizen and the nearby pharmacy um, is similar, it's actually not the same if you take public transportation. The time opportunity cost was not similar. So when the OpenStreetMap community uh, pointed this out via a parliamentary interpolation, well, they actually proposed a better distribution method, which went into distribution the very next day in 24 hours. And similarly, when people invented a way to simply use uh, your phone, even on the lock screen with no app downloaded, to point to the QR code, which translates into a SMS already composed for you, and just press send, and then you're done uh, doing the contact tracing. Uh, again, this idea from the civil society became a nationwide rollout with more than 2 million venues adopting it in just a matter of one week, actually three days. Again, and this is because people understand the principle of how QR code works, of how SMS works, of the trusted number, the 1922 number that they already call uh, to feedback their ideas to the Central Epidemic Command Center. So on a pro-social space where people can meet to address the common urgency with a commitment to respond within 24 hours in a public press conference. These are the spaces where the government trusts the citizens maximally. So because I understand the opening is five minutes, I will stop right here and I'm happy to explore this idea of trusting the citizens maximally and co-creation in social innovation uh, in the panel that follows. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Tang. Well, very important keyword merged trust, trust, uh, especially uh, trust on the government, trust on the general public. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, you know uh, concept is very important uh, in order to build a resilient society. I understand. Uh, Kono-san, based upon the presentation by Tan-san, maybe you had very difficult uh, problems. Uh, well, trust with uh, the people because the trust with uh, the bureaucrats of all ministry. You know, ministries are very vertically separated, especially in the case of Japan. Uh, if, I, if you have a fight against the uh, Ministry of Welfare, for example, uh, this kind of problem is existing. Of course, it depends on the maybe side of the, comp the country in terms of the population. Uh, we live in a very, uh, very mature uh, civil society. It's of course good. Uh, however, we have more than uh, 10, 100 million population, 100 million population. Uh, this is a very difficult uh, issue, uh, uh, problem in Japan. For example, in the case of uh, Google, as far as I know, the Google, the great company, tried to digitalize the city of Trump in Canada. However, they couldn't do that because well, they couldn't get trust from the public maybe. Data, pro data privacy issue, data security issue, et cetera, et cetera. So how can we establish this kind of trust? Especially in the case of Japan, we have many difficult problems, I understand. I really appreciate if you give some comments. Uh, of course, including all uh, points that were raised by Dr. Tang. Thank you. Uh, 
In my case, it was trusting the mayors or trusting each cities. I mean, each city has its own, uh, you know, geography, uh, population, or the culture. So we cannot we cannot tell them how to do it. Uh, that was my main theory. So I told them, you know, you need to keep the temperature of the vaccine. You need to put uh, in uh, VRS, the vaccine record system. You need to keep the lot number of the vaccine. You need to do those three and the rest, it's up to you. And the health ministry was like, they were trying to tell each mayor how to do it. And I said, as I said, I said, don't, don't do it. Um, so it was like uh, trusting the mayors and uh, I think they were very, very responsible and uh, that's how we are uh, successful. So the division of the power between the national government and the local government was a major issue, my case. And uh, some private companies developed uh, applications how to uh, get in touch with uh, vaccine company for a side effect and things like that. And, but the health ministry never tried to promote it. Uh, the reason is, well, we, we need to be fair. So we cannot uh, recommend a single application to the public. But I said, well, there's nobody else who's been doing this. It's only one company that has developed this application. So why shouldn't we uh, let people know that with application, you can do this or you can do that. So the trusting, trusting the mayors, trusting the public sector, I mean, private sectors, uh, I think that was a key issue. And when we were trying to develop the vaccine uh, recording system, VRS, we had our several companies. We listened to several companies and they came up with proposal. There were major, major international companies uh, down to a startup, a very small startup for uh, seven years of the company, company history. And that's what we chosen because we, we thought they could do that. And I, I got criticized by the opposition party. Why are you choosing you know, such a small company and not a big international name? And well, the big name say they had a software and they asked us to use it as it is. And uh, I thought uh, our cities and towns are not gonna be able to do that. So this small startup could develop system according to the need of the cities. And I went along with it and I think that was successful. So uh, for Tansan, it's trusting the citizens. Uh, for my vaccine case, it's trusting the mayors and the trust is the key. So I had, a I had to communicate with uh, several hundred mayors uh, online. So almost every other day I was uh, talking to the mayors online and uh, they had a problem and they just put everything on me. And uh, I said, well, I had to deal with it. Uh, so it was, we need to change the national system uh, according to their requirement. And I think that's why the mayors trusted me that if they had a problem, they can just simply call me. And I got a call on my mobile phone, quite a, quite a few of them. And uh, I said, well, I cannot, if I cannot give them solution, I said, I'll, I'll back you up, do whatever you think right. And whatever you do, I will support it. And that's how we solve the problem. So, well, sometimes you, you, you just have to be responsible and you just have to trust the others. And if they fail, it's your responsibility. But this time, no one failed. So I stayed until <laughs> October.
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Great, great. Oh, one specific question may I raise, uh, Kono san. Well, uh, trust is uh, the base of uh, uh, the society, resilient society, of course. However, in the case of Japan, where division of power is, of course, important. However, in my understanding, to, to, to get it simply, well, getting vaccine from Pfizer, Moderna, that is the role of the central government. However, just vaccination, real vaccination, uh, in the, that's the shot, shot, vaccine shot, was the role of the local government. This is, uh, well, so you, you said that you trusted the mayors. However, in the case of emergency for like, like uh, the pandemic, much more direct access in the case of Taiwan, uh, where he trusted the citizen, right? So we need some new type of governance, maybe society governance in the case of emergency. Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, in usual case, uh, division of power is very important. However, in the case of emergency, we need much more strong control, maybe. Uh, this is a very important task so that we can create, so that we can create much more resilient society. This is a very fundamental task for Japan, in my understanding. Do you have any comments on this? Well, that's, that's how I thought at the beginning. And there's a clause in the law that the government or actually the minister could direct doctors uh, what to do. And uh, we, I wanted to use that clause. And uh, the prime minister told the health ministry that uh, let me use that clause. And the ministry said they would consider, and they still considering <laughs> after eight months. <laughs> so in case of emergency, I thought the national government need to have a stronger power. But uh, as I look back, maybe not. Maybe each city, town, uh, they have, they know better. They know how to deal with the people. So in case of emergency, I, I think what I did is put efficiency over fairness. A lot of mayor asked me to distribute the vaccine, you know, uh, fairly. And I said, wait a minute, I don't do that. Uh, those cities who can do faster get more supply because I didn't want them to slow down. So those who are very slow didn't get much. And some mayor criticized me, that's not fair. And I say, I don't care about the fairness. I prefer efficiency over the fairness. So the, those mayor need to speed up the process and they get the vaccine. So in case of emergency, um, we go efficiency or you know, over fairness. If you put the fairness on top of efficiency, Everyone slow down and everyone get treated fairly, but everyone get, you know, slow down. Uh, so if you put the efficiency over the fairness, everyone try to speed up the process. So, so that was a decision. And uh, um, I could have been criticized for that, but uh, every mayor wanted to speed up. So I think that was right. So maybe in case of, some emergency, maybe the national government need to have a stronger power. I think if it's like, a, you know, real security, uh, the national government need to have more power. But in case of COVID-19, I guess what we needed is trust, trust the local government. Well, thank you, Konsan. Thank you, Konsan. Very persuasive. Yes. And uh, we, so far, we focus too much on the vaccination and uh, uh, COVID-19. But anyway, in case, uh, since we are going to discuss the uh, innovative resilience, I'd like to expand a little bit the, the scope of the discussion. Now we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution. 
And of course, digitalization is an important part of that. Uh, at the same time, well, the human talent issue is becoming a very important task. Well, uh, Dr. Tang, you are in a symbol of uh, this kind of a digital talent, digital genius, maybe. At the same time, uh, digital uh, literacy for the general public is very important. And also high level digital human talent is also required. I really appreciate in the case of Taiwan, uh, you, also, you already have some good talent. Uh, you are the symbol of that. I really appreciate if you give some comments on the, this uh, human resource aspect of the, uh, uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, this is quite uh, important related to the resilience of the society. Uh, Dr. Tang, uh, could you kindly make a comment on this? Definitely. Uh, I'll answer the question, but I'll also talk a little bit about vaccination. So um, I, I think uh, where we're in Taiwan, we're looking at digital and media competence, not just literacy. Literacy is for an era where most people listen to radio or watch television and could not become a radio or television producer easily themselves without investing a lot of capital. Uh, but nowadays with social media, hopefully pro-social social media, each and every one of us are makers of media. So in our lifelong education, as well as in our basic education, we stress the importance of say, the middle schoolers uh, typing the transcript and fact checking our three presidential candidates as they're going about in their forum and debate early 2020. So the middle schoolers become vaccinated uh, against the various polarizing or hate or vengefulness because they've literally taken all the signs. Or when we talk about environmental science and climate, uh, even primary schoolers uh, host air boxes where they measure the PM 2.5 level in their balcony or their schoolyard and so on uh, and uh, upload it to a distributed ledger system. And so the very abstract concepts like data stewardship, data bias and so on are not taught but learned because once you become a contributor to climate science, you of course begin to understand that accurate data matters and how to correct for bias uh, and things like that. And most importantly, you will earn trust from your fellow citizens who trust your uh, weather station's data more than the national government because it's closer uh, to where they live, so on and so forth. So my, my main point is this, uh, whatever we do, uh, we need to make an immediate social impact to the society and community in order to learn from a maker, remixer's mindset. Otherwise, it, of course, critical thinking, creative thinking, all very important, uh, but people would not have the ability to organize among themselves from individuals into what I call the social sector that can set the norms and habits and so on for the change that's required to address a emergency. And it is thanks to this very well-organized social sector in Taiwan, like GovZero, that we can actually uh, talk to the mayors during vaccination. I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, each and every one, and show them the actual social preference of their individuals, each and every individual, which vaccine type do they prefer to receive and so on. So the fairness is to the individual citizen level, not to the city level. And if the city cannot deliver uh, the vaccination um, um, capacity, then we just on the national wide vaccine appointment system simply uh, direct uh, people to the nearby districts of nearby cities. And we always give the cities exactly the same amount as their capacity meeting uh, the citizens' demands. And that means turning social preferences via the social sector as social objects that allowed people, everyone, to think beyond the local optimum but rather into a more holistic understanding of where to go uh, as a country or as a global community. Thank you. I thank you very much for the human uh, talent aspect and education aspect and uh, yes, uh, or uh, kind of uh, 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 literacy related uh, aspect is very important uh, to create a resilient society. Uh, Kono-san, uh, I'd like to you focus on the case of Japan. 
or digital agency was established about a month ago. And in the background of that, in the ruling party, I understand Kono san, Hirai san, and Taira san. Uh, these are uh, very innovative politicians played a very important role uh, to, uh, to, to stimulate the former Prime Minister uh, Suga. And uh, well, that's amazing that in, within a year, uh, about a year ago, uh, former Prime Minister Suga declared to establish the digital agency. And within a year, a new agency was established. This is an amazing uh, a, a task, I think. And the, what, what, what kind of uh, task do you uh, request, do you expect on this role of digital agency uh, in the innovative, uh, resilient uh, society? Well, uh, maybe Maxima-san will, Maxima will come to this conference, but before that, I'd like to hear your opinion on this point. How can we strengthen the resilience of this society uh, through the effort by this digital agency? Um, there are several stages that a digital agency could do, should do. Uh, one, we need to get rid of the paper. <clears throat> there are a lot of paperwork still uh, done in Kasumigaseki and uh, that's slowing down the process. So we really need to get rid of it. And then we need to sort of uh, uh, cross use the data. Um, you know, last year we provided 100,000 yen to every Japanese people living in the country. It took several months because you need to have, you know, you need to have people fill in the application, uh, mail them in, and then we need to process it. This year, we had a uh, special uh, special money give out for the children in a low income family. We didn't ask people to fill in the application. We knew who are uh, <clears throat> eligible for this. And uh, we knew that which bank account uh, they have got kodomo uh, uh, <clears throat> uh child care uh, allowance. So we simply uh, took that tax information and use the bank account for the child care allowance and uh, provided the money. And it took just like that. So that shows the power of uh, digitalization. But uh, it, it was done so smoothly, the media didn't really notice what's going on. <laughs> so not many people knew about what we are, we were doing. <clears throat> um, but uh, that's something we can do. Uh, so there are very strong opposition from the opposition party for using my number uh, to cross cut the data. But uh, now it's kind of obvious the Japanese government are way behind uh, global standard in using data to support the people. So I think we are hoping that we can uh, ease the rule for uh, my number usage uh, for many things. So number one, we need to get rid of paper. We need to change the uh, digital system in uh, national government. And then we need to change the rule for my numbers. So things are going uh, smoothly. And the new digital minister, uh, Karen Maxima uh, is one of the originator of the digital agency. So we have quite high hope that she could manage all these. Well, thank you, Kon san. Well, uh, my number, personal identification system, it's uh, maybe the important base of the digital society and the uh, resilient society in the, fourth, in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, still, we have to go back to the important concept of the trust. Well, when we started this My Number system, many people were very anxious about that. Oh, I must be controlled by the government through this number, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, this is the taxpayer's number. First of all, this kind of uh, uh, you know concept of heard by that. Uh, so, do you think this uh, in the case of Japan, this kind of uh, trust on this or reliability on uh, the, the 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 my number is already uh, established or not? I I think more and more people are realizing that are uh, we need to move forward in this digital age. And I think more people are willing to uh, use personal ID system for you know, a lot of things, not just a tax or social security, yeah. but uh, um, well, I guess for those who are not willing uh, to use that, I think we need to have a separate system, but that is quite inconvenient for them as well. So we are hoping that we could bring in uh, everyone on board. It will probably take some, some more time, but uh, I guess uh, before COVID-19, people are not much paying attention to the use of the personal ID and the media often talk about the big brothers watching you with my number kind of thing. But now I think more and more people are, well, it's fine if Big Brother is, you know, helping me, that's that's better. So it will take some time, but I think we, we are moving yeah. uh, big way right now. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Tan, I'd like to uh, raise a very similar question to you. Well, uh, how, well, in the case of Taiwan already, you have uh, the, the, the great, uh, this kind of personal identifi identification system. As far as I know, India is in a sense the most advanced country in this regard. Uh, could you mention a little bit about personal identification system in your country and how uh, this system helped you uh, to, to promote your uh, trials in your country? Certainly. I mean, we, we had this debate uh, in 2003. Uh, and so uh, our national health insurance is entirely IC card based. Uh, and it includes not just citizens, but also residents as well. Uh, you can see our national health uh, logo, sorry, wrong direction, right here. So, right, so, so that's the symbol of our national health service. It's universal in the sense that if anyone get COVID-like symptoms, they can use that card to go to a nearby pharmacy, to get some masks, to go to a nearby clinic, uh, to get diagnosed and so on with no uh, any physical burden. And people already trust the IC card of National Health Service uh, of only being used for public service purposes and never for uh, advertisement or other commercial sector purposes. I understand this is the same as your My Number card. So uh, this is a, a done debate. Uh, we've done that in 2003 and we've not uh, looked back. In this uh, pandemic, however, not the SARS pandemic in 2003, um, our uh, main debate centered around this contact tracing system. Let me replay this again. Uh, you didn't really type anything when you scan the QR code, right? Because the uh, carrier of your mobile phone already know your phone number. And when you check in, you see these 15 digit systems here, but these systems um, do not actually concentrate any data. The 15 digits, only the venue know what does it mean. Uh, and the telecom doesn't know what those 15 digits mean. And the five telecom operators do not actually share the check-ins with each other or with the health ministry or with the uh, anyone really, unless there is an actual confirmed case that warrants contact tracing. So this is a advanced cryptographic idea called secure multi-party um, computation. Uh, without the pieces pieced together, it's like noise. It's not going to compromise anyone's privacy. And in each and every SMS, it's said, for epidemic control use only. That is to say, you will never be used for anything else uh, and it gets deleted after 28 days. But it's not just about abstract trust. It's also about trustworthiness. So each and every one person can go to a simple website called sms.1922 and know exactly how many SMS have been sent 
since May when the system was introduced, a quarter billion. Uh, and how many of these are looked after, looked upon by contact tracer around 11 million and entering their own phone number, they can see in the past four weeks, which cities, which numbered contact tracer have looked at their numbers. It's called mutual accountability and so on. And so the point here is that our use of national health card is always interpersonal. It's never just personal data. You always get the trail record of the pharmacist, the clinician, the nurse doing the um, operation. And it's now being extended to the idea of contact tracing with the telecom companies. But if you do not trust your telecom company, you can always go back to paper-based check-in if you trust the venues more uh, than your telecom companies. So there's always a graceful fallback to people who do not trust the QR code and so on. And we see that more than 20% of people do not trust new apps downloaded. So this is not a new app. This is literally the built-in SMS and camera of your phone. Well, one, one specific question. Well, also in my country and in all, many uh, industrialized countries, the inclusiveness in this kind of digital society, it's uh, becoming a very big issue. Uh, but in the case of Taiwan in your country, uh, you, you, your, the, the inclusiveness pro uh, problem is not so, not so serious compared with the case with Japan. I have this kind of impression. What, what, how, how or why did you establish this kind of a situation? Yeah, because we do not invent new data collection apparatus during the pandemic that did not exist before the pandemic. And this is out of uh, necessity of compliance also, because we've never entered lockdown. We've never entered a state of emergency. Uh, we have a continental law system. So without state of emergency, we can, in the administration, we can only do whatever the budget and laws that the parliament already authorized us to do. And so this means we need to work with the parts that exist before the pandemic instead of uh, like literally inventing new wheels and so on. So the, the point here is that by working with what people already are comfortable with, we can actually promote social innovation on all levels. I mentioned the QR code scanning. Well, there's many startups that invent their own safer and quicker QR code scanning mechanism. Like my preferred QR code scanner, the Taiwan Social Distancing app uh, is a Bluetooth enabled um, exposure notification system that works internationally with Apple and Google standards. But most people just use it as a QR code scanner. Uh, and the Bluetooth, of course, work in the background. But it doesn't uh, mean that people need to turn on Bluetooth for the QR code scanning to work because it worked through SMS. The leading antivirus company, Trend Micro, uh, the vaccine uh, report system, uh, the Ji Guan Jia and so on, all have their own take on the QR code scanning and integrate uh, with the experience that their um, function already offers. So it's not like a traditional procurement situation where if you procure from a vendor to build a physical bridge, no other vendor can build a bridge there. Rather, by opening up the standards based on well-known standards like QR code, uh, invented in Japan. <laughs> Thank you for that invention. Everyone can actually make sure that the innovation that works for them uh, continue to work better when they uh, are competent, not just literate. And even for people who are very senior, who prefer paper, who doesn't even have a flip phone, well, as I mentioned, they can always uh, have a physical stamp uh, and stamp a piece of paper and hand it in as they check in the venue. Again, we're not taking away anything. Uh, by introducing digitalization apparatus or simplifying the queuing, the checking in the venues for the people who have mobile phones so that the elderly people who prefer a piece of paper um, do not have to queue in line because there's relatively few of them and they can also enter the venue rather quickly. Okay, okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, still, we want to continue this kind of discussion but the time is quite limited, so now the time uh, to open the floor uh, to comment, your comments and, and the questions. Uh, please uh, raise hand if you have any comment questions. And uh, 
Okay, uh, please identify it. Please give your name uh, and belongings. And uh, okay, Horizon, please. I'm Yoshi Hori of Google with Japan. My question is as, move, is, as we move forward post COVID-19 era, what improvements do you wanna see in the government sectors and societies? If I'd like to hear one or two improvements or advices uh, moving forward in government and societies. Okay, Konsan, please. Well, um, the government seriously need to think about increasing productivity of the government. Uh, right now, the bureaucrats in Kasumigaseki work long, long hours. And uh, this year, we are now, we just started to pay overtime for those uh, government bureaucrats, but they still stay very long hours. So we seriously need to increase the productivity so they can have normal lives. Okay, that's okay. And uh, Tansan, do you have any comments? Yes, uh, well, I'm switching to a different camera, uh, but I hope the voice still works. So um, I, I think uh, obviously, Obviously, uh, the teleworking situation in Taiwan uh, was already pretty good before a pandemic. But what we've discovered is that the pandemic allowed us to telework not just between the satellite offices or across the ranks and so on, but form ad hoc working groups uh, across ministries, across levels of government, across the civil society and with our international counterparts. Uh, for the first time, we discovered that we're doing a lot of the same things uh, with the international community tackling the same urgency. So why don't we just form an ad hoc and become, if not time travelers, uh, time zone travelers. Uh, so I wake up and uh, attend the North and South American uh, working groups. Uh, I go to sleep uh, after taking a part in uh, the European and African counterparts and so on. So truly a, a global ad hoc group uh, already tackling the counter pandemic and increasing on climate and so on issues, I believe is the main thing uh, that we learn uh, as the result of this global pandemic with shared uh, urgency so that we can uh, invest not just in implementing the global goals, but uh, working to form shared goals uh, through digital means. Okay, well, in order to realize uh, this kind of new society, some kind of reform is needed, especially labor market reform is the most important one, I think. Uh, uh, my, my, my worry is uh, in the diet speech by prime minister, the word reform disappeared, but that's my worry anyway. Okay, please. Hey, uh, Jesper from Tokyo. Um, Minister Tan, uh, big question here. Um, Mr. Zuckerberg is going to create the metaverse. Um, so the virtual world is gonna become even more comfortable, even more seductive. Do you think that there's a big threat that civil society gets undermined as the private sector focuses aggressively on creating a very, very comfortable virtual world for all of us? Dr. Tang? This may be a good uh, opportunity for me to read my job description because it answers that question, uh, although somewhat poetically. <clears throat> and when I become the digital minister in 2016, Taiwan uh, had no digital ministers before. So I have to explain uh, what does it mean to have a digital minister. And so uh, I wrote a poem, a prayer really, that goes like this, it's very short. Uh, when we see the internet of things, Let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let's always remember the plurality is here. So just like social media could be anti-social or pro-social. The metaverse, so-called metaverse, could be a isolating virtual reality versus a pluralistic shared reality. The ideas of shared reality, co-presence and so on, 
is based on the fundamental principle of plurality, of the ability to fork, meaning that just like GovZero, who look at all the government websites, something that GOV.TW, and if the GovZero people don't like it, they fork the government, creating something that G0V. The TW. So by changing an O to a zero on your browser's uh, URL bar, you get into an alternative that works in a pluralistic fashion, but free of copyright restrictions. So people can, just like Wikipedia, continue to remix and edit it to fit their own preferences. Even the governments, we can merge back the contact tracing, mask map, and so on as GOV services after GovZero forks proved popular. So this ability to fork and merge, to form shared reality through plurality, that is the, the real thing at stake. That is what enable us to build assistive intelligences or AIs in such metaverses that will work like my glass, which is aligned to my interest of wanting to see better, but it doesn't push advertisement to my uh, retina. Uh, and when it breaks, I can fix it myself or bring it down the street for the repair person without paying a, a huge amount of license fee on so-called uh, patents or intellectual property. So the point here is that the glass is an assistive technology. It assists me. It's aligned and accountable. And so each and every piece of the metaverse need to be similarly assistive. Otherwise, it becomes authoritarian intelligence. OK, thank you very much. Now I'd like to accept the questions from the online participants, please. Thank you very much. We have one online question, so do allow me to read it. It's from Tatsuo Kawasaki. And the question is, what kind of improvements in the international dealings is needed to counter the next pandemic? And is there anything specific between Japan and Taiwan? Okay, Konsan. Well, um, one, one thing we learned from COVID-19 is there's still division in the global system. I mean, countries like Japan, US, Europe got the vaccine, but the countries in Africa or Middle East or Latin America were, you know, sort of uh, not able to get enough vaccine for the people. So for the next pandemic, I think we need to learn how to work as one, uh, you know, one global system, how to develop the vaccine and how to uh, provide them uh, and how to how to vaccinate people so that we can actually stop spreading the pandemic. Uh, COVID-19 is not fatal. I mean, it's bad enough, but uh, it doesn't kill people instantly. The next pandemic could be worse. So we really need to learn how to work as one team. Tan San, do you have a comment? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and uh, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Japan, uh, the government and its people uh, for the generous vaccine donations. My own second shot of AstraZeneca would not be possible without the Japanese donation. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I do agree that the next pandemic could be worse. It will probably be worse. Uh, and we need to have this cooperation and training framework that works on issues of global urgency, not just pandemic. Uh, during the non-pandemic, uh, I wouldn't say post, postponed pandemic, uh, yes, so that when the po uh, pandemic actually comes, uh, SARS 3.0 or something, we can actually tap into the already trustworthy uh, network of the participants and so on. Uh, and I'm really happy that Japan has joined the previous, uh, the only US and Taiwan hosting uh, global cooperation and training framework and contribute a lot to it. So through this um, Taiwan, US, Japan, uh, GCTF global cooperation and training framework, uh, we're now able to build a network of around 100 countries on, of course, humanitarian assistance during COVID, but also energy efficiency, cybersecurity, women's empowerment, and other very important global urgency issues. 
Okay, so I can accept one more short question, maybe. Okay, last question, please. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a question uh, around, uh, Tarasan, you mentioned, you know, being fair versus efficiency. Uh, and I think in terms of rolling out the vaccine, uh, there was a lot of benefits that we had from rolling things out faster. So as you mentioned, going back to the economy now, what are your views on fair versus efficiency in terms of reopening borders, uh, in terms of accelerating things on the economy? And I know that in Taiwan as well, there's a very uh, hefty uh, kind of, uh, you know, it was a, uh, over two weeks period for people coming in. And I can't help but notice, uh, I guess, a lot of the feelings around uh, making it harder for people to enter Japan um, and enter Taiwan and how that kind of prevents COVID, but also the uh, kind of uh, the flip side of that in terms of the impact it's made on the economy. So just kind of curious thoughts there. Thank you. Okay, I expect the very compact answer, please. Samsung, please. Me okay yeah all right uh yeah we're we're nowhere near uh Japan in vaccination right uh, our first shot is seventy three percent I think five percent uh shorter than Japan and uh, second dose only thirty two percent uh mostly because we started uh later rather later so um until we reach a similar vaccination rate as Japan uh we would not uh, relax uh, our border um, quarantine measurements uh to be even more like than Japan uh, that would not actually work. Uh, but for the coming lunar year, I believe the 14 days has been uh, shortened to 10 days and then four days uh, at home quarantine. Uh, so yeah, we're making some improvements, but it all depends on vaccine rollout. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, considering the time constraints, I'd like to ask the very final comment, uh, the Kono san to ask the final comment. Well, later on today, Dr. Bill Emmert will appear, I heard. Is this correct? Yeah, and he now they use the term perpetual, perpetual pandemic. We have to make preparation for the perpetual. Whenever, anytime the a pandemic will come or variant, new variant will come and new type of pandemic will come. So we have to make preparation for that. Creating the resilient society maybe. So considering that I I'd like to uh, ask uh, Kono-san to make a very final comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the vaccine rollout is going quite well, I think. And the uh, drug to treat the COVID-19 is coming up soon. And now we are moving into the de debate over economy, especially how we're going to deal with the excess debt of uh, SMEs. Uh, are we do we do we put efficiency over fairness or in treating the SME access debt or are we going to uh, treat uh, are we going to put uh, fairness over efficiency in that that need to be debated. I think it's gonna be a big issue. I mean, we save a lot of SME that could uh, uh, fallen down during the COVID-19. We had uh, probably the smallest number of bankruptcy uh, this year, uh, thanks to easing money. But now we have to deal with the consequence of it. So that's gonna be a big, big issue. And uh, I mean, Fighting against the COVID-19 is science, but dealing with economy is not just a science. It's, you know, the activity of the human being. So it's gonna be quite difficult. Well, thank you very, very much. I expect that the, uh, the discussion the provoked your thought. Anyway, uh, from here on, uh, we are going to have a breakout session. I really hope you enjoy the whole day discussion here in G1 Global. Thank you very much. And please give a big hand to the panelists. Thank you.